Hello, and welcome to a special Fireside Chat event, The Secrets of Top Performing Companies. It's all in who you ask. This conversation will be hosted by Manish Gupta, Vice President of Marketing, Java and Graal VM at Oracle. Manish will be speaking with Jeff Lawson, CEO, co-founder and chairman of Twilio and author of the new book, Ask Your Developer, How to Harness the Power of Software Developers in When the 21st Century. Thank you for joining us today. A couple of housekeeping notes before we begin. All attendees have been placed on mute. We invite you to submit questions throughout the event via the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen. Jeff and Manish may answer your question live during the presentation. Also, the session will be available on demand should you wish to revisit it later. And now I will hand the floor over to Manish and Jeff. Welcome to the session. It's great to be here with Jeff Lawson co-founder, CEO, and chairman of Twilio, which provides cloud communications and customer engagement platform to over 220,000 customers worldwide. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. Jeff uh, has been a developer throughout his career and who manages to code even now, despite the wide canvas that he has to manage on a daily basis. Um, in his new book, Ask a Developer, you know, Jeff has brought together his experience as a CEO and his long experience as a developer. So let's, uh, let's dive in. Jeff, you ready? Absolutely, let's do it. Great. You know, you talk about ask your developer as a mindset. What do you, what do you mean by a mindset? Absolutely. I mean, I think when you, when you think about how you go about building um, a company or products, <clears throat> or generally speaking, doing innovation, you're really what you're talking about is a, is a culture. Like how are you going to go about exploring the frontiers of what's possible? and deciding what you should do, deciding how you're gonna do it, and actually pulling the right people in to, to do that work. That's really about a cultural change in companies for how business leaders, technical leaders, and other leaders are going to work together to accomplish these things. And one of the interesting things that, that I've noticed is that if you think about the modern digital economy, right, it's pretty clear that it's the companies who are able to listen to their customers, who are able to then go hear their problems and build software to better solve their customers' problems. Those are the companies that ultimately win the hearts, minds, and wallets of those customers and end up, end up winning. Because today we live in a world where the customer experiences you have are on these devices, right? It's no surprise, but... A great example of this is your bank, right? 20 years ago, if you uh, walked into your bank and they had enough parking and you walked inside and there was a, a new paint job on the place and the teller was friendly and they gave your kid a lollipop, you'd say, oh, okay, I like my bank. Nowadays, your bank is a mobile app. And so what does it mean if you like your bank? Well, it's like, well, the app, it, it loads fast and it doesn't crash and they've adopted the, you know, sign in with your face feature so you don't have to type your password. And there's uh, a, a continual evolution of features that make your life just a little bit easier. Those are the things that would say, that, that will cause you to say, I like my bank. And that is a digital value proposition. So it's the companies in every industry who get really good at listening to their customers answering their customers' needs better than their competition with software, those are the companies that win. That is a build culture. That is a build mentality. Because if you don't build software, if you just buy solutions off the shelf, plug them in, in this world today, when your customers have needs, like you're not in a position to be able to solve those because you're not in a position to actually solve problems. You you just bought something, you're not building. And so I think the world today that we are in is what I call a build versus die world. It used to be build versus buy was the decision that you had. You decided if you should go build this thing or some vendor is going to sell it to you. But if you can't listen to your customers and you can't build a roadmap that's stronger than your com competition, then eventually you will get replaced by the companies who can listen to customers, who can execute fast and build the answers to your customers' problems. That's why I believe we are now in a world of build versus die. And so the book is really for executives who are undergoing di digital transformation. Um, and there's been no shortage of things said about digital transformation. So the book is not trying to say, here's why digital transformation is important. Like we all get it. It's important. It's 20 years into this thing. However, very little has been said of, of, of all the literature that's been written about digital transformation, almost nothing has been said about the actual people doing the digital transformation, the people with their hands on the keyboards, the developers. And what I find is that business people, executives, 
have a very different way of like doing their jobs and thinking about the world oftentimes than their technical talent. And the rift between technical talent and business people often arises, right? How often do you hear the notion of, uh, you know, the executives like, why is it taking so long to build this software? This is, this is nuts. I can't believe it. They, they told me it would take this long. Or how come, hey, developers, how come you can't tell me exactly what date we're going to launch this thing? Or maybe you can tell me what date, but you can't tell me exactly what features it's going to have. Like, are you, are you people any good at your jobs, right? And so you get these like, because uh, we as developers, we often give these sort of nonsensical answers to business people. It's a part of uh, Agile, actually. So it's like, that is intellectually correct, but it is infuriating to business people. Meanwhile, the flip side is the developers look at the business people and be like, oh, you know, you pointy haired Dilbert boss, you know, you don't get it, you don't get anything. And so this divide between business people and the, the technical talent is a thing that holds back companies in truly unleashing the ability of every company to become great builders of software, great innovators. And when you talk to business people, every single one of them says, oh yeah, we want innovation. Oh yeah, we want to we wanna do all these things. Yet nothing's been said about how really to unleash the people who are doing it. And that's why I wrote the book, to try to cross this, this, this divide between business people and developers. And the book is written for the business people so that they can better understand what developers do, how they do their jobs, what their motivations are, and actually what goes on behind the scenes so that they can better understand how to incorporate technical leaders and technical talent into the process of building a truly innovative company. You know, make, makes a lot of sense, uh, particularly last 12-ish months through the pandemic, it feels like the companies that have been in the forefront of being digital and having innovations as driven by you know, workforce that's software-centered have done really, really well. Um, do you think this mindset is now going to be a little bit more immersed uh, into the daily corporate uh, thought process, into how the teams are organized, uh, what the strategic sessions might look like, who the participants are? Uh, do you think it's, you know, the, this last 12 months and the learnings we've had are, are really, really going to foster that more now? Well, I think what you saw during the pandemic was largely, in some ways, a, a you know, bifurcated outcome of companies. There were certain companies who were well set up to execute digitally. They already were down the path of building. They had hired developers. They had a mindset of listening to customers, hearing, seeing new problems, and realizing that picking up our tools and building the answers is how you make progress in this economy. Um, and then, and those companies did fairly well because when the world changed overnight, a whole host of new problems arose that needed solving. Um, those companies were in a good position to be able to respond, be agile, see the new challenges the world had presented to them, whether it was turning digital for e-commerce or you know, telemedicine, distance learning, and all these industries had to change overnight. They were able to respond to those changes relatively well. I was talking to the CIO of a major big box retailer last year who said they saw a six-year acceleration of their e-commerce adoption in one quarter. And it's like companies like that who had e-commerce, was, was actually very good at e-commerce, but just saw a multi-year expansion in the use of it. They, sure, it was, it, was, it, was, it was frantic and they were scaling and all sorts of things, but they were well set up to serve their customers and themselves and their shareholders and everyone else during the pandemic. Now, the other story though, of the companies who really hadn't made that transition, you know, companies who really didn't have you know, a lot of digital uh, investment that they had made. You know, I think about some retailers were still in like 2020, if you went to their website, you couldn't really buy things, right? <laughs> Here are the brands that we carry and they had the store locator. It was like the website from, you know, 1999 that somehow they still had, still had up. Those are the companies that you just saw go out of business, to be frank, because yeah. they were not, they couldn't pick up their tools and start building because they didn't have the developers. They didn't have the muscle to be able to see new challenges and answer them by building. And those are the companies that I think got cold, if you will, during the, the pandemic. And really what, it, what you saw was an acceleration in the pandemic of what competitive forces were naturally already doing. And I think that's what we saw. And now the companies that have survived, I think, are actually much better off. You think about a whole host of companies who were battling uh, you know, e-commerce giants like Amazon and were making progress, but you know, so is Amazon. Well, uh, the pandemic required those companies to up their game. Just to survive, yeah. 
to survive, to stay in, to literally stay in business. Yep. And so I think actually we are going to see those companies now in a much more competitive, uh, competitive spot for the future of commerce than maybe we would have seen if it wasn't for the pandemic. So yeah, absolutely. I think those companies uh, who are already invested uh, to a good degree in building and the, and the digital value proposition really accelerate their progress in that field. And that's going to continue. Yeah. You know, when, um, when you've, talk to the executives, CEOs of various companies where you do see a little bit of this as for developer mindset that, that exists, the culture exists. Um, are there particular areas, when I think about customer experiences being one, base of innovation being another one, maybe time to market being a, are there things that are inherent where, where you've seen, you know, for the companies that have that mindset, they, they do deliver better customer experience. They are faster and more agile in innovation. They get to market faster. But are there specific things where you say, you know, this is sort of the front of the spear that you immediately feel when you have this mindset? Yeah, I think the two biggest things that I talk to companies about, and I talk about in the book, is number one, share problems, not solutions. And number two, companies who have a, a culture of experimentation. So let me talk about those for a minute. Yeah. Um, at most companies, the idea of how people build software engineering is that software engineers take things like product specifications docs that are written by the business side and they take those and they turn them into code. And it's almost like a translation of the factory model. Like if the factory is like, you know, the first step in the line is a business person, a product manager or someone else goes, talks to customers, writes up a PRD, a product requirements document, and then hands it to the next stage in the line, which is the developers who turn that into code. It's, it's, it's like this factory. It's, it's like developers are a black box where, you know, PRDs and, and Mountain Dew go in one end and code comes out the other. And in that world, what you've done is you've really pigeonholed the developers and you've tied their hands to say, well, all you can do is to write code to this specification. But developers are creative problem solvers. Like that's the essence of, of writing code. But for most of the developers I've ever met in my life, their ability to creatively problem solve is not limited to like, how should I write this sort algorithm, right? It's, they are creative problem solvers across many different facets of life. And yeah. when you expose those developers to the customer problem that you need to solve or the business problem that you need to solve, what you've done is allowed them to exercise their full brain to come up with creative solutions that are also very aware of what's possible in technology and also very aware of the code base that exists today, the architecture that exists today. And they can often find better solutions when you don't tie their hands, which kind of makes sense. And so what I advocate is that businesses share problems with developers. So, you know, one ex like an example I'll give is if you, if you gave a, a product spec to a developer and said, okay, we need a form on a website and there's a field that says last name and it's 40 characters long and a field that says first name that's, you know, like, you can clearly specify exactly how this thing should work and a developer will dutifully build it for you. But if you share with the developer an idea of like, hey, what we really want is to make it so that our customers can sign up for our, our website in you know 20 seconds instead of 20 minutes, that's the business outcome we're looking for. Yeah. Now the developer can say, oh, well, if that's what we want, I've got it. There's a bunch of different ways to do that. And so uh, you know, another great example is when uh, you know, developers are often given a specification, like here's the PRD, and they ask to spec it out. How long is this gonna take to build? And they go in and okay, here's the spec, they read the spec, they look at the code, they look at the architecture, and they'll come back and be like, okay, we spec'd it out, it's gonna take nine months. And the business people are like, what, that's crazy. How, how is it gonna take nine months? And you know, everyone's all agitated. Like, well, you tied my hands, right? You said that you need it written exactly this way. And I looked at where we are today and where we wanna get to, and that's a nine month journey. But if you suddenly say, well, here's the problem we're trying to solve, the developer can say, oh, well, I see where we are today. Oh, with some, you know, I, I see the path we can get there. Oh, I think we can do that in, you know, three weeks. Because they can find a better path knowing the starting point. The non-technical people don't know the starting point. They don't know how the code works, the architecture works. And so what I found is that when you share problems with developers instead of solutions, you get better software because the developers have an intrinsic understanding of what they're trying to solve for written faster because they can find a better path there with more passion involved in, in solving the problem. So who doesn't want better software written faster with people who care? Every executive wants that. 
And so when you share problems instead of solutions, you really get better outcomes. Yeah. The second thing is I talked about is the, the, the culture of experimentation. And this is key, right? At most companies, um, ideas are treated as things that need to get executed on, right? So an executive has an idea for some new product or something like that. It's handed to a team. It's okay, you got to go execute on this. And they'll go staff up a team. They'll make the investment. They'll build a product. They'll launch it. And like three years later, after tens of millions of dollars spent, turns out customers don't want the thing. And it gets shut down. And there's usually some you know, negative career consequences for all those involved. It's like, oh, they didn't execute. It was, you know, the executive had such a good idea. This team screwed it all up, you know. And, uh, and so it's- The needs evolve, or the needs evolve, right? Yeah, or the needs evolve, exactly. And so um, in a culture of experimentation though, you treat every idea as a hypothesis and a hypothesis that needs to go get tested against customers, generally speaking. Because if you think about the nature of experimentation in software, you can build just about anything. Like rarely in business is the question, is it possible to build this thing in software? I get it when you're doing self-driving cars or whatever, it's a little different. But for most of us, the problems we solve with software isn't a question of whether or not it is possible to build software that does this. The question is, if we built that software, is it of any value to our customers? Will they pay us for it? Or will we save money? Will something about our business get better if we build this software? That's a hypothesis and it should go get tested experimentally with customers. And so if you take that same story where an executive had an idea and they give it to a team and that's treated as a hypothesis, not marching orders, then that team goes and tests it with customers. And maybe they spend you know, a few hundred thousand dollars and three months later they come back and they say, you know, we tested it with a bunch of customers and we found that they don't want that. You know, that team should be rewarded. They should be, they should be paraded through the streets because they just saved the company millions of dollars and years of wasted effort to find out one more thing that customers don't want. Absolutely. And oftentimes through that process, they also say, oh, but by the way, we did find that we think customers do want this, which is something that's closely related to the original idea. Now, you know, your next experiment that you should go run is to prove out the hypothesis that indeed that is what customers do want. And so in a culture of experimentation, you reward people for uncovering truths as quickly and inexpensively as possible, as opposed to treating every idea as gold. So those are the two biggest things that I often talk about in creating an environment where you're going to enable your teams, your technical teams to do their best work. Number one, share problems on solutions and two, build a culture of experimentation. You know, I'm, I'm very fascinated. And it's not just in, in coding or development, but applies everywhere, right? Marketing campaigns, for example. Uh, experimentation is key to success and for better efficiency as well as better ROI in, in many parts of the businesses. And it's always puzzling to me when, when you see management saying, just do it, right? Do well one thing. But I think if you don't experiment and fail, you really are not going to get to the ultimate answer. I absolutely agree. You know, one of the things uh, I, I heard, uh, you've got uh, a little bit of a Java background in your career trajectory. Uh, going all the way back to your college days. So do you want to share the exciting things you've done uh, with Java? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I was thinking about the most interesting um, uh, experiences I've had with Java. And, I, you know, I can't beat the experience that I had back in, um, actually in college. This was in the, in the late 90s. There was a professor. I went to the University of Michigan. There was a professor in the University of Michigan Museum of Zoology who was studying the evolution in the changing body shapes of piranhas. <laughs> Piranha. Like, and so and he literally had like gone all around the world. He had these jars everywhere, these specimens of like piranhas that have been found. And, and he was trying to analyze how evolution basically in the, in the line of piranhas has occurred over the last, you know, whatever, million years. And so he got a grant from the NSF to build a, fish scanner. Exciting. <laughs> and he hired uh, myself, my co-founder of Twilio, actually John, that's where I met John, and, uh, and a few other folks to build him a Java-based desktop application where he would plop <laughs> these fish down on a bed with a webcam sitting above it, take a snapshot, and then plot out, like drop little pins on the key spots, like the dorsal fin and the mouth and the tail and whatever. And then he would apply math to showing the, 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 the morphological changes of the fish over, over all, between all these different specimens. So the end result of all that stuff is I built a fish scanner, <laughs> more specifically a piranha scanner in Java. 
Perfect, perfect. So, you know, Java has just completed 25 years, right? So it's a very, very special moment. So to the long list of use cases, we'll now add a Piranha scanner by Jeff Lawson to, to the use case that Java has supported, uh, along with the Mars rover. It's fantastic. It's great, great, great anecdote. You know, as I was reading a book, which was a, really a, a wonderful read, uh, this whole mindset and the chasm between what the developers focus on, what the executives typically focus on, and how the connections don't always exist. Um, you know, we see that with our customers in the Java world uh, every single day. You know, developers care about innovation, getting the latest technology and features out as quickly as, as they can. Executives focus on you know, partnering with the right companies, that the trusted relationships are important. Security is important to them. Having business flexibility, lowering the risk and mitigating the risk, those are things that are important. And so the challenge we face every day is how do you bring the best of the world of Java platform while providing the executives things that they care about, risk mitigation and things like that. And so, you know, one of the things we've done recently is the Oracle Java SE subscription that continues the development in a transparent manner. So developers get access to that as quickly as they'd like. And, and then the executives get the risk mitigation and, and the protection and security that they need. So a little bit of direct connection to, to the kind of the message that you've delivered in the book to, to our business uh, as well. You know, I, I talk about in the book, the value of infrastructure. And infrastructure is one of those investments that executives often don't understand and therefore try to cut, you know, when you're in the annual budgeting process and you say, how much, how come we're spending this much on stuff that customers never see? Like, how can we spend less on that? And the reality is, is that infrastructure enables developers to do their job better, faster, cheaper than if they didn't have that infrastructure. And it, and, you know, and so you don't know the cost of not having infrastructure unless you don't have it and you see how inefficient everybody gets. And I think Java is a pretty similar way. It's infrastructure that makes every developer better able to focus on the code that counts, right? The stuff that actual customers are going to pay you for and the things that matter while taking care of a lot of the underlying complexities so that the developers don't have to. No, very well put, very well put. Um, Jeff, you know, you've been an entrepreneur for a long time. You've successfully delivered products, companies to the market, and, and certainly building a, a, a mega company with Twilio. Then you've seen that VCs and entrepreneurs naturally lean, uh, particularly if they're building a, a high-tech company or a software-lean company, lean very heavily on developers right from day one, right? It's not an afterthought. Mm -hmm. However, in larger organizations, it, it's, not, it's, it's not the first thing that comes to mind. Why is that? Is it just you know, kind of how people have been trained, the MBAs that they have received have, have taught them differently? What do you think is the reason behind that? Well, I think for companies that are undergoing this transformation, the transformation uh, often begins on the business side, right? So for companies operating in a legacy, you know, a legacy like an incumbent in a particular industry, the whole idea of hiring developers and, and setting them loose to go build for your customers, it's, an, it's a relatively new idea in the grand scheme of things, right? 20 years ago, IT was a cost center. And it was something that you had to spend uh, you know, money on, but it was mostly like laptops for the employees and, and keeping paper in the printers. And, oh yeah, I needed an Oracle financial system for my CFO, right? And so those things were, were cost centers. And the general idea was, oh yeah, you outsource those things and you try to make them as efficient as possible and spend as, as little as possible. And that made sense you know, 20 years ago when in fact those were cost centers. But nowadays what happened because of the web and because of mobile is that the customer value proposition has turned into a digital one. And in that world, software isn't a, a cost center, it's your core value proposition. It's what drives revenue. It's what drives customer adoption, satisfaction, retention, and, and ultimately business success. And in that world, you can't outsource it, right? You can't, you know, you're not trying to drive costs out of it. It's a completely different story for the role developers and technical talent generally plays in the company. And so every company has, has had to go through that transition from looking at IT as a cost center and something that you outsourced to something that is core, that is a core like cultural and skill set you need to have in the company and to put those people not in the back of house, but in the front of house, like right where, where your customers are to build that core value proposition. And that's a change that's occurred in the last, you know, 15, 20 years. And that, you know, kind of explains why, you know, startups were born because of the opportunity to serve customers better with, with technology naturally had that inclination because that's where they saw the business opportunity. That's why they started a company is because they saw a way to serve customers better than the status quo. 
But then one by one, each one of those incumbents in the industry wakes up and says, oh, wow, like, look at that startup. They're stealing our customers because they've got better ideas and they're able to execute on them. We've got to do that too. And so they start hiring developers, putting them in the front of house, focusing them on customers, listening to those customers, building a roadmap. And I think that's the, the process that leads you to this Darwinian evolution of every industry that leads you to that build versus die notion. Yeah, yeah makes sense. You know, we've been talking about management's perspective and how they can and, and should engage the developers to get more out of that resource pool and the talent uh, that exists. Uh, flip that around for me, Jeff. Uh, so what can developers do to be more heard, to be more strategic and to be involved in corporate execution planning? Are there steps that they can take? And if I'm working for a 30,000 person company and I'm a software engineer, what can I do to make sure that my Kind of creativity and knowledge you know is, is actually heard and used the biggest thing that i would say is for developers is don't allow yourself to get pigeonholed as just someone who writes code because it'll become self-fulfilling right if, if the business sees you that way and you see yourself that way then you'll have a career of writing code but if you really see yourself as someone who can solve a variety of problems and you know technology like that's our tool that's you know software is our tool that we use to solve problems but if you see yourself as a creative problem solver instead of someone who writes code, then there's a whole universe of, of, of problems that you can apply yourself to. And so assert yourself into business problems and customer problems. Become a part. Don't say, I just want to put my head down and write the code that people tell me to write. Say, I want to actually be involved in understanding the customer problem. I want, I'm going to ask questions. I'm going to ask, why does the customer want it like this? Let's say you're in an environment where you do get handed PRDs. And I get it. Like you, you maybe can't transform the whole environment yourself, but you can say, you know what? I want to understand why. I want to go see a customer. You know, there's a story I, I, I share in the book of actually a product leader at Twilio. His name's Ben. And his first job out of college was at Bloomberg. And he was writing software for, you know, the, the Bloomberg terminals that traders use. His job, like straight out, fresh out of college was like writing, you know, one of those widgets that's on the screen. And he got there and he asked his manager, he said, so when are we going to go, you know, see a customer? And the manager kind of you know, was like, oh, well, you know, that's, a, that's an interesting idea. We've never done that before. You know, maybe that's, maybe that's something we could do. And Ben was like, wait, are you serious? We, you guys, you've all been writing code for this thing for how, however long and you've, you've never talked to a customer. So Ben just took it upon himself. And he's, he, he had a friend who worked at, like a, a, at a bank. He said, you know, mind if I come by? I just want to see how you use our software. Shows up on the trading floor. And he says, yeah, here you go. And shows him his Bloomberg terminal. And they had always imagined that their little widget on the Bloomberg terminal was like, you know, this big, beautiful, full, you know, 30 inch screen with, you know, like part of the trader's experience. Well, it turns out it was one of like, you know, 400 windows on that screen. It was about that big in the corner, like, you know, 20 pixels by 20 pixels. You couldn't read any of the fonts. The chart looked like crap. And Ben was like, are you serious? Like we've been slaving over this stuff and, and this, is what, this is how you perceive it? So he goes back to the team. He said, you'd have no idea how customers use the software we build. Nothing is legible. And so that, they started thinking about, okay, we need to use different fonts. We need to use, you know, different uh, rendering techniques because like right now our product is practically unusable. And they would have never known that if, if they hadn't gone and just seen a customer use their software. And so what I would say for developers, be like Ben, you know, ask to go talk to a customer, ask to go, can I, can I sit down on a sales call? I just want to hear what customers talk about. I want to hear what they ask. I want to hear what's on their mind. Um, and uh, become involved in why you're building software, not just the act of building it. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really, really good advice for developers. Uh, we'll, we've come to the top of the hour. Jeff, any parting words uh, or advice or guidance uh, to companies or individuals or companies? Yeah, well, what I would say, two things I would say. Number one, so as far as the book goes, I hope you all enjoy it. I think you're all receiving copies of it. Um, I hope you enjoy it. The book is written for the business people to better understand us developers. And as a CEO myself and a software developer, I've got a foot in both worlds. I thought it was needed. So if you enjoy it, share it with your business leaders. Because that's really who the book is written for. The other thing I'll say is that uh, all the proceeds from the book are helping more underrepresented people enter the field of technology. So helping um, veterans and uh, the black population, the Latinx population, and uh, other folks who are underrepresented in technology enter our fields. So all the proceeds are really going to help expand the purview of, of, of people who are helping us to build this technology future. So I appreciate your support there. And um, share it, share it with your, your business leaders if the things in this book resonate with you. Wonderful. Great chatting with you, Jeff. Continue quoting with Java.
And thanks. Take care. Thank you, Manish. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Manish and Jeff, for that insightful exchange. We thank you all for attending today's session and hope you're able to get some food for thought about how you approach innovation and collaboration within your own organization. Visit oracle.com slash Java to learn more about Java and the Java SE subscription offering and find information on upcoming Java events. Finally, get more information on Jeff's new book by visiting askyourdeveloper.com. Thank you all for your attention and support. This includes today's presentation.